I'm very happy to be here and to share our experience on decolonizing the mind. Uh, the paper I wrote uh, is a, a paper that goes into uh, the experience we had in decolonizing historiography in Suriname. But my introduction goes beyond that paper uh, uh, and I will deal with the theoretical framework which we are developing uh, in, uh, uh, for decolonizing the mind, to develop a theory of decolonizing the mind. Now that theory has been developed not as an academic exercise. It has been developed in conflict. It has been developed as a war between two schools of thought in the Netherlands. And the school of thought which I designed uh, and I termed scientific colonialism and uh, decolonizing the mind as the two schools. Now, the war started uh, because of uh, one professor uh, there are very many arrogant white professors in the academia who think that uh, uh, their oh, okay. Okay. The, the, uh, they start by challenging us for a debate on the historiography of Suriname. And their normal attitude is that if I challenge you for a debate, you are so scared you don't take it. Uh, so when we So when we accepted that challenge in debating white professors, we start with a proposition that if you are a professor at the university, it doesn't mean that you are a scientist. You can be an ideologue of colonialism. It is not your position in the academia that makes you a scientist. It is the content of your argument. Now, if you start with that proposition, they see it as an insult because they have been accustomed to go to start from the premise that a professor at the university is a scientist and not an ideologue of colonialism. Okay, um, going into those debates, we started criticizing the very factual and the paper goes into some of this criticism of what is wrong with the historiography uh, of, of the Dutch regarding Dutch colonialism and extend it uh, further to the historiography of Western uh, colonialism. And uh, what we have then developed concepts which have been derived from knowledge producers which are not recognized as knowledge producers in the West. Because knowledge producers in the West are academics at university who conduct research. But we argue that activists and artists produce concepts to understand history and understand social relations, although they never have gone through the educational system. And we use those concepts, apply it in analysis of a, a social and historical situation, and develop it into a theory. Now, one of these concepts regards epistemology. So, uh, in the West, you will have a lot of discussions of what is truth. And uh, uh, you will have concepts, like we are discussing, if there are multiple truths, if there are pre-reversal truth, that you have your truth and my, I have my truth. And we start with the epistemology developed by activists that says we might not know what the truth are, but we certainly know what lies are. So we started looking at the lies which people have produced and from those lies we developed the alternative concept and alternative framework. Now let me give you, uh, the paper go through a, a few examples. And I'll let you know what the differences are in our approach. So one, one of the things, for example, is that we say we have to test a lot of the propositions developed in the West with facts and logics, facts and evidence. If you do that, you will come to the starting conclusion that 
a lot of these things are fantasies and lies. So let me give you the example in the historiography of slavery. In the historiography of slavery, uh, the abolition of slavery is uh, 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 the, the, the cause of the abolition of slavery is ascribed to the abolitionist movement in Europe. The abolitionist movement, because of the moral high standards, have waged campaigns and enabled the, the Europeans to abolish slavery. Now there's a discussion and a debate going on. C.L.R. James and Eric Williams who argue that the abol abolition of slavery, the legal abolition of slavery, is because of economic factors, right? So the, the thing is there. So in the British historiography, the question is, is it due to economics or is it due to morality? Now, uh, the Dutch didn't have any abolitionist movement. So the question is, why then did the Dutch abolish slavery while there is no abolitionist movement? Now there's a professor called Campus Indy, who I debated, who says it is because of indifference, not because of economics, because of indifference. So we test this hypothesis by logic and say indifference is not the motive. Greed is a motive, you know, love is a motive, but indifference is not a motive. So logically it's nonsense to say that people act out of indifference. It means indifference, you don't act, you don't care. The second thing is, if we're talking about evidence, we go back to the historical sources and look why the Dutch politicians at that time abolished slavery. And it appears that they take into account material conditions because the slave population was uh, 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 going down uh, and if they didn't import indentured labor from uh, India, uh, uh, the, the slave system wouldn't survive. And in fact, they wanted the compensation of the uh, enslaved enslavers to be done by the enslaved. Now these are facts. So we test the facts, but we move a, a, a point further by looking at the question of abolition in a general framework and take up the concept that Mark Colum X has developed. And Mark Colum X says, if you stick a knife in my back, nine inches, and you pull it out three inches, you haven't done me any favor. <laughs> so, if we look at abolition, then we see that the abolitionists didn't pull out the whole knife. They put it out three inches. And if you apply Malcolmic's concept, we develop into a distinction between two forms of abolition of slavery. One is a civilized form, and the other is an uncivilized form. So that is where we take the concept and they argue that the difference is this. The civilized form acknowledges that there was a crime. The uncivilized form gloss over it and acts as if there was no crime, there was some uh, uh, historical necessity. The uncivilized, the civilized form uh, uh, offers apologies. The uncivilized form thinks that the enslaved should, should be thankful and grateful for the abolition of slavery. And we reframe it as if you are asking me to say thank you for not raping me anymore. So the concept of Civilized and uncivilized ability of slavery is not there in the historical literature because they think that the abolition of slavery was a highlight in European civilization. And we say because it's an uncivilized form, they should have paid reparations to those people who have suffered. In fact, they have paid reparations to the enslaver. They got the money. So we use the concept of Malcolm Mix and develop it into a, uh, 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 a theory of how to look at the abolition of slavery. I'll take another example um, where we, we take the propositions which Europeans have proposed and fill it with other data. And I'll stick again with uh, uh, the, the question of uh, reparations. In the Western logic, which we apply and accept, 
says that if you put a business on the premises which is not yours, you take up land and you put the business, it's not yours, you should pay rent. It's accepted in economic theory. You don't go on somebody's land, you put a business and you don't pay nothing. So we think the colonizers should have paid rent for, colon for colonizing all these countries. Then we say, if you go to a shop, you take a bottle of water, you should pay for it. It's accepted. It's accepted anywhere, by the way. So we think that if you go to the Americas, you take the gold and the silver and you don't pay for it, you have a debt there growing. We argue that if somebody, you hire somebody to, to paint your house, you should pay a wage. It's accepted. So if people have been working as enslaved people without getting paid, you have a debt accumulating there. And we argue that if you cause harm to somebody, which is accepted in law, you should pay compensation for the harm you have covered. And we say, and that's not accepted in Islamic uh, economics, but otherwise, if you have a debt, you should pay interest, unless you are Muslim. So, we take all these premises and put it up in a mathematical model and calculate it how much is the debt that they should pay, the Europeans now, for reparation. It is startling if you do that. Why? Because, take for example, the number the, the amount you have to pay for wages for enslaved people, right? And that's another thing of the lies which are being conducted in, in the West. If you look at the number of victims of transatlantic slavery, in every textbook you will find the number of 10 to 12 million, which is basically the number of people that have been captured and kidnapped and brought who left the ports of Africa, which was 12 million, almost 2 million died on the way, and 10 million arrived in the Americas. So this is what you see in museum and textbook. We have a different concept of victim. We think that the people who have died on the way in Africa from the moment they were captured in the villages until the 500 kilometers they had to go to the coast are also victims. But they have died in Africa. And per living person who left Africa, two to five died on the way. So that means you have about 60 million people died in Africa. For every person born alive in 300 years and immediately after born were enslaved, we look at the number who have been born into slavery in the Americas, which is per generation three to four people of the 10 million. So actually the number of people are 400 million. These are not in the textbooks, but if you calculate the amount of wages that you have to pay for these people, we have in this economic model that you will have to pay 321 times the GDP of the United States and all the Western countries. 320 times the GDP, which is, we're talking about trillions, we don't talk about billions, or about trillions, which is 30 trillions of the GDP of all these countries, and the order is 320 times five. Now this is based on the logic and acceptance of the premises of economics which I mentioned. Now, if we go to, uh, uh, so we, 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 we use the data, uh, we use the same proposition and put all the data into it. Now, 